don't forget to like and subscribe. You can also listen to this on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And we have a PayPal account for any donations that you'd like to give. Your generosity is greatly appreciated. Welcome, everybody, to the Gate Expectations podcast, where I bring in a weekly guest, talk all things Yu-Gi-Oh!, and get to know a little more about each person I talk to. This is the only Yu-Gi-Oh! podcast that is run by a full-fledged journalist such as myself. This is episode 29. If you haven't checked it out yet, you can check out earlier podcasts with guests like Stephen Trifonoski, Jesse Cotton, Team Samurai X1, Farfa, Crush Cards, Simo, and many more. My guests for this week are two of the three winning members of the Luxury Championship Series 3v3. One is a two-time LCS champion as well as a top eight World Championship qualifier finish. And the other is a seven-time Premier Event topper who has been a top ten player for the points race in the World Championship qualifiers race for Europe. It's Gabriel Nets and Christian Thomas of Team Fala Galera 4.0. Christian and Gabriel, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast. It's uh, it's nothing. Thank you, thank you for having us. <laughs> uh, absolutely, and uh, you guys uh, r- really made me happy uh, winning that uh, that uh, luxury championship series tournament yesterday, and uh, and uh, especially especially with your teammate Paulo as well, who's uh, been a, been a good friend of mine as well. And he and actually, you know, he's coming on next week, so it's nice to get the whole gang finally on the <laughs> podcast. So, uh, first of all, how did you guys feel when you actually won that tournament? It felt kind of insane because we were like almost out by round five. Yeah, <laughs> and, and like some games, it just felt lost. But it felt pretty good to win again. It felt good to win with these guys. Mm-hmm. Yeah, same. Like uh, especially for me because, um, in case you guys didn't know, like I made um, top four in all of the LTSs I uh, I topped mm-hmm. so far, and I got second. I got second twice. I got third. The other time, so I was really hunting the LCS <laughs> win, and like in the finals, I think Gabe was the first one who yeah. lost his match. Then I think Paulo won his match, and then my match was the last one. So Gabe and Paulo joined my call, and we were playing really, really slowly to make sure we didn't uh, make any misplays. Like we were triple checking any every play <laughs> I made, and then finally it came to game three. And then I won, so it was a really nice. Did, who was sure. the one that did anyone lose in the finals? But in, in the three v three for you guys? Yeah, I lost. My, I lost my finals game, lost. game in like five yeah. minutes. <laughs> but to be fair, to be fair, I need to say Gabe um, carried in the top cup <laughs> pretty hard. Like he won top sixteen, top yeah. eight, top four. Yeah. So it, he was able to lose the finals, and it, it was that, that's fine. the advantage of three v three. Like, 3v3. like yeah. it doesn't punish you for a variant hitting you. Hmm. I mean, yeah, I mean, exactly. it's really nice to have like good teammates with you. So, like, in case like you know you have like a bad bad round or something, or like there's a, there's a match that you just you just can't win, you just can't win no no matter what happens because that's just how Yu Gi Oh is that you have like two good teammates at least that can carry. And it looks like you guys had a, had a really good run there. Uh, you know, how did this team come about uh, before this LCS happened? I mean, I knew Gabe. Um... Pretty much, we started talking in this year. Yeah, no, uh, last year, yeah, 2020. Yeah, and like we prepared a lot for the other LCSs mm-hmm. as well. And there was also the Luxury Champions League, which is an Ironman league where you pretty much like Ironman, other people, uh, other people. And we played that one together. And then, like I said, yeah, we're in the Irish Discord server, the famous Raft server, where we like we call there pretty often, and we also test together, we theory together. So I knew Gabe. Mm-hmm. And Paolo has been a long-time friend of mine. I know him since uh, since three years now, since beginning of 2018. And like me and him, we always prepare together for events. We always like talk theory pretty much every single day. We also test together. So when they first announced um, that there's going to be three free LCSs as well, for me it was clear that I'm going to play with Paolo because originally I wanted to play with him for the first IRL mm-hmm. 3 3 which was um, Atlanta of 2019, so the mm-hmm. one he won. But I decided to not go in the end um, because of university. So then when they announced the luxury 3 3 tournaments, it was clear that I was going to play with him together. So we were just uh, looking for another player. And this time uh, I wanted to play with Gabe as well because, like I said, we also know each other pretty well. And I think, yeah, we synergize in the team 
pretty good together mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, it's a bit of a funny coincidence because like Christian's friends with Paulo, and then I also knew Christian, and I also knew Paulo as well. Because I mean, he's Brazilian. I'm Brazilian. <laughs> there aren't there aren't that many Yu-Gi-Oh players over here, so it was really nice to play with both of them. Uh, yeah, we got along well. It's, it's good to have like a good team like at, at atmosphere on those kind of events. Like if you lose a game and someone's mad at you, it won't mm -hmm. help you get better. We all just like you lost, it's fine, it happens. Mm -hmm. Let's go to the next one. Did you guys do a lot of testing uh, before this event? Yeah, we tested a lot. <laughs> tested a lot. Like, so, like, were you guys like, uh, you know, like on like a, on a call together, just like playing with each other, or just kind of just talk theory, or did you guys just type it type it out on the computer? Or what did you guys do exactly to train? A bit of all of them. Like, I played Chris a lot, and I know Chris looked at a lot of replays with Paulo. So, we, and then like we we chatted about theory about stuff and like the the Discord group chat. So I think it's like a mix of everything. Like you gotta play, but you also gotta discuss. You gotta like watch games. Uh, we tested everything, like literally every viable option we tested for this tournament, mm -hmm. and even some non-viable ones. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know that like one of the one of the deck choices that a lot of people were questioning with you guys when you were, when the deck lists were released. I know you said it already, like online, because I, I know the reason already. But I, I'll ask you again. So, uh, why did you guys put uh, like Predator, Verit, and Akande in your deck list, even though you had like no viable targets like whatsoever with it? Oh yeah, so um, yeah, like Gabe said, me and Paolo, we were watching a lot of replays from our mm -hmm. testing sessions, and when we do that, we always think about why we lost that game, and like, or we also think about cards that could solve this issue and like maybe mm -hmm. win us the game. And one situation that came up frequently, especially against Drytron, was that if you have like Sanguine set and a Golden Land, then you usually use them obviously mm -hmm. to interrupt them. Like you, you throw a Kato, you chain the Sanguine, bring God, mm -hmm. banish something, and then against Drytron. Either they completely stop their turn, which is obviously fine for you, but if they don't, then it's pretty likely for them to make a Zeus with four materials in the extra monster zone. And in this situation, they are not going to use the Zeus because for them, the Golden Land and the Lord don't really threaten the Zeus, so there's no reason to use Zeus mm -hmm. for them there. But this is pretty bad for us because we play against a four material Zeus where we don't have an out, so we needed something to mm -hmm. out that card. And then Paolo was telling me to look up the, all the Link 2s that exist. And I found the Anaconda. And I was, I was asking him, like, can't we just play Anaconda? Because realistically, there's not really a reason for them to not pop there. Because in their head, like, if they don't use the Zeus there, then you just summon Anaconda. And then if they use the Zeus after the... Uh, sorry, they, we just summon the Dragoon. And if they use the Zeus after the Dragoon hits the field, it's obviously way worse mm -hmm. for, for them. So we thought that this was a pretty good card. Because it just baits out the Zeus um, without having to commit any card, pretty much, besides the Golden Land and the Lord. So that was pretty helpful. Um, unfortunately, for me at least, it didn't come up in the tournament. I think it was mostly because I just didn't play against many Drytrons. Like, it was the second most popular deck, but I was only playing against one Drytron the entire oh, wow. tournament. Like, all of Swiss, all of Top Cut, only one Drytron. And this is the matchup where it came up the most. But um, regardless, I still think it's good because, like, you, you can't really say the card is bad just because it didn't come up in the tournament because like in testing you obviously do way more games than in the, in the tournament and I tested a lot against Rytron and in testing it was coming up a lot for me and I think it might have come up for Paolo in the tournament as well and there's also more niche scenarios where the card also came up um, this also happened in testing for example against uh, Virtual they often do Croco Dragon or Chuchi against you because those cards are pretty good to prevent your one zoo play from going mm -hmm. through and in this in that situation when you're grinding with them in the mid game it can also just happen that you end on a lord and a gold land against them and then if you have like a zoo in hand you can just do the anaconda and they pretty much have to use croco dragon or chucha there and then you can normally summon the zoo and go for the six material mm -hmm. zoos play so yeah we felt like it was a pretty cool take for mm -hmm. the tournament so what made you guys decide with your deck choices? Because I know that uh, you know, Christian and you, you, and, you and Paolo decided to go with uh, the Eldritch Root. And uh, Gabriel, you decided to go with uh, the Dragon Links there. So what was the decision on you guys to make those deck choices? Uh, I think Chris and Paolo were testing Eldritch Zoo for like forever. Mm -hmm. that, that's good. It, it requires like a very high level of a specific kind of technical play. Mm -hmm. uh, which I think you, you need to dedicate a lot of time to get there. I also didn't want to play out Lich cards. Uh, it, it feels uncomfortable to me. It's like a playstyle thing. I don't think the deck is bad. It just wasn't what I was testing more. 
And when mm -hmm. when they got comfortable with Eldritch, which was like one week to go, and I thought Dragons also had a pretty good matchup against the field. It had a very good virtual world matchup, which we assumed would be the best represented deck. Not necessarily the more represent, most represented deck, which it was as well. But like the mm -hmm. deck represented by the best players, which I think were pretty accurate on that. And mm -hmm. the Dragon Link encapsulated that. It was a combo deck that could play 17, 16 hand traps both sides, had a lot of one card combos, and did enough going first to win games when you win the die roll. Mm -hmm. It was pretty good. Yeah, yeah. So for us, um, I guess it's kind of interesting because Eldi is not really perceived as a meta contender by I think most of the good players mm -hmm. right now. And even for me, like I think even one week before the LCS, I was still not really convinced about the deck. Um, I was testing it, that's true, but I, I I kept losing. But then me and Paolo really took the time and watched like most of my re replays together, and then we realized that I was doing quite some mistakes in those replays and the thing with this deck is it's not like the deck doesn't really have a high ceiling so you pretty much have to play perfectly because even if you do like one slight misplay then you can lose the game because mm -hmm. of that so the misplays really get punished in this kind of deck that's why yeah one single misplay can just lose you the game and then i was testing it more and more and the more i tested it obviously the less mistakes i did and then I think a few days before the LCS, I started having actually good results against Virtual World and Drytron finally. And that's the, that's around the time where I got convinced about this deck. And I mean, I think it was a good choice because obviously you can play the 15 hand traps in the main, which gives you an advantage over all the other combo decks because the issue with Virtual World and with Drytron is that in our opinion, you can at maximum get like a 60-40 against the mirror match because Virtual World can main 9 hand mm -hmm. traps, maybe 12, but then you don't play good, so you have other issues like consistency. Drytron can play uh, 3 to 6 hand traps in the main, which is also not really enough to confidently win going second against any of the combo mm -hmm. decks. So in our minds, the goal was to find a deck that can play 15 hand traps, and we did that with Eldrissu. And another issue was like we were scared about the uh, going first because the stake is obviously a lot weaker than virtual world or right yeah, going first course. because they are FTKing the opponent we are just ending on like a dryden with two hand traps maybe sanguine conquistador stuff mm -hmm. like that but um after testing the turn one felt good enough against the combo decks most of the time obviously you don't gonna have like you're not going to have a as good win rate as the combo decks because they're just FTKing like we can lose going first if we don't get hand trapped, combo decks can't lose going first. But the trade-off is that you just gain a lot of percentages going second. And that felt really important. And I think overall, like we kind of came to a similar conclusion because I felt like Gabe's choice with Dragon Link was also pretty good. Um he only well, he only like he still has nine hand traps in the main game one, which is pretty good. But then post side he I think he, you can even cite 17, yeah. right, in Dragon you're going so, yeah. I think we both like thought the same thing. We're doing it by slightly different paths, but every good player, like you recognize there's like two ways to go about this format. Or you play the best decks, which are Virtual Road and Tritron, ceiling-wise, mm -hmm. and then you just like hope for the best, hope you win enough di, di rolls, hope you open your reducted world of hand traps, hope you don't break playing Virtual Road, or you try to do something else, which is trying to make a deck that consistently can beat those decks. And that's kind of the, the angle we went for. Yeah, because like... Yeah, yeah and I, I think Dragon Link was also a pretty good choice, to be honest. Because like no one expects yes, this, yeah. really no one. Like, I mean, we were aware of the deck, um, obviously because of Gabe. So we also knew that maybe some other testing circles discovered the deck. But I think it was a pretty good call because people didn't know how yeah. to play against it. Also, cards like Nibiru aren't really popular uh, right now in the main deck. Cards so, like yeah. Lancia and Draw that people think really hard Dragon Link aren't that good. Because mm -hmm. your deck plays slightly different than old Dragon Link did. So people just had the impression. We, we had this impression at first. Like, why would you play Dragon Link in a format everyone's citing Draw and Lancia? Yeah. Actually, they're just like wasting a card. You're still making Seal Tiding, Seal Tiding Hand Trap, Seal Savage Hand Trap, a combination of those interrupts. Which is not like a super board, but it's hard to die through. Mm -hmm. And then you're playing like a, a, a grindier game than old Dragon Link did. So the deck evolved a lot, and I also think it was a decent choice. 
Yeah, because when, when you play against uh, Drytron, usually they're pretty good for about maybe like the first about two, maybe three turns, and then they they kind of lose all the resources there because because they've exhausted uh, pretty much everything. And Dragon Link has been known for like having an excellent grind game because of like all the recursion it does and like how much how like quickly they can put a board like after even after you take it down. But like as a person who actually hasn't played against Dragon Link, I'm surprisingly haven't. Uh, can, can explain the. Uh, the the dragon maid and and the trap card that's in there for me gabe could you yeah uh this is like probably the biggest change in dragon link i guess it's the usage mm -hmm. of chamber chamber mm -hmm. was first used with tiding and hospitality so the idea was that it or search an extender in hospitality which is just like a free level for someone or it mm -hmm. searched the trap the dragon made tiding which is a bounce uh with time and testing hospital hospitality is a brick if you draw it without chamber because it only revives dragon maids but the tiding is like super strong because if you just go like chamber search tiding that by itself is an interruption and then mm -hmm. on your next turn so you do that turn one turn two you bounce turn three this tiding banishes from grave to summon this chamber back to get another tiding that can bounce mm -hmm. another card and banish itself to summon another chamber so like just from this one chamber you're like getting two summons and like two interrupts in the grind game Mm -hmm. And it, it's it's also pretty decent to draw because if you get drawn on cha on chamber, you already guarantee the tiding, and then if you have any extender, which is like your whole deck basically, you are going mm -hmm. to end on the seal tiding, which is a very hard board to kill through. Uh, mm -hmm. It's a very good LP target. It's dark for chaos space. It's level four to make chaos ruler with tracer, so it it had a lot of synergy with this deck. And in your your hand trap lineup, there would you have would you have changed that at all? Or would you have they kept it the way it was? Uh, you could play Nib over Meister. It's it's hard because it, it depends on what you're playing against. Especially in Trivia Trees, it's harder because everything is so diverse. Mm -hmm. uh, you could argue Nib's slightly better than Meister now because more people are playing Dragon Link now and Adam and Spater. But last week, I don't think that was the case, for example. So it, I think it was correct for the tournament. I don't know if today I would play the same list. Yeah, and do what? What losses did you have uh, when you were playing in the LCS? I just lost some combo mirrors. I played like all combo mirrors. It was insane. <laughs> I mean, it's it's your go for you. But... Yeah, dude, of course. <laughs> uh, Christian, for you, like, I'm looking at your uh, tra hand trap lineup there. You've got you said you wanted to play 15 hand traps, and uh, of course you got you got Ass, Skullmeister, Ghost Bell, Crow, and uh, and Troll and Lockbird. Uh, would you have to switched it up a little bit uh, nowadays? Like, like looking back at that tournament, um, I think for this tournament, no, because um, Drytron was still really really popular. That's why we felt that um, Crow and Droll were good in the main deck because those are like like especially Droll is pretty impactful against Drytron, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um, in hindsight, I feel like now you can probably cut Crow and Droll because Virtual World was the most popular deck and especially after the new set, like they're gaining the new monster, they're gaining the new trap mm -hmm. and the pot, so they're getting huge support from the set. That's why I think you need to prepare more for Virtual World now and not really um, not really that heavily against Drytron like we did for this mm -hmm. tournament. I guess something that was interesting is that we opted to play or we, we opted against Nibiru in the main deck which um, many people think is really good against Virtual World. But um, like we discussed this with Gabe as well, that's why I think he also came to the conclusion to play Meister. Like we actually thought that Meister was the better hand trap against Virtual World. And I guess I can explain that. So against the two cut combos, you can obviously stop them with Nibiru because there's no way for Virtual World to play around yeah. it. But the thing is, Maester also works against every of the two cut combos because you can hit the spell in the grave. <laughs> but there's a big difference. Like when you Maester them, they pretty much have to stop playing because there's no other virtual world name for them to use, yeah, right? Yeah. Because we're assuming they only have two cards. So in case of Nibiru, they're going to, uh, like you're going to Nibiru them late, obviously, after the fifth summon. So that means they can have the level nine synchro, the Shen Shen in the graveyard. They're going to add, uh, add back one virtual world name in the end phase with Gigi. They're going to have another spell in the graveyard for the next turn as follow-up play and the trap will be live. <laughs> So those are like huge downsides in case of Nibiru, especially the trap is a big issue against the stack because uh, your win condition going second is to resolve your one zoo play and if you can't do that, then you're probably going to lose. That's why you really need to cut off all ways to stop, um, to prevent them from stopping your zoo play from resolving. And against the three cut combos, Mesa isn't enough, like because you're going to negate the king long, but if they have another name, 
they can sometimes uh, just continue to play. But the thing is, against the free cut combos, Nibiru also wasn't enough because they can either play around it by making the number 75, the bamboozling, or they can just opt for the double VFD play. And that's why, like, we as a team decided to play Mace over Nibiru in the main deck, which I think was good. Yeah, yeah so, that, so, so for that, uh, so you just want to do that because you wanted to... Uh, you know, prevent your f- opponent from like getting a lot of resources in the end phase rather than and just cut them off right then and there rather than letting them set up. But... Exactly, because the outcome is pretty similar. Like Nibiru prevents VFD but against the two cut combos, but so does Meister. But Meister has the upside of like the trap also being dead and they won't have follow up. So we thought it's pretty clear that Meister was the better hand trap. And even against um, Drytron, mm-hmm. I also think Meister is better there because you can cut the Benton access, so the only argument left for Nibiru was that it's better against the combo decks. Uh, I mean, the other combo decks, so Adamant's Pater and Dragonling, mm-hmm. which is a fair argument um, because those were on the upcoming, mm-hmm. we felt like, in the week before. But in my opinion, the argument wasn't that huge because I think there were like maybe 10 Dragonling, maybe 10 Adamant's Pater in the tournament. Mm-hmm. So that didn't feel like enough to justify playing Nibiru in the main, at least for me. And I think for no, games, I, I also think that in Outledge specifically, Nib is kind of bad because it does conflict with Sanguine and you're going first. Mm-hmm. And it does clear your own board, so it does clear your own zoo, which is kind of a follow up. Yeah, which you don't want. Yeah. So it, it's a bit awkward. It, it all depends how well people are playing. I think that's another thing. Nibiru is a card specifically that very, punishes very harshly people playing badly. Which is less mm-hmm. likely to happen in Nelsias, less likely mm-hmm. in the top cut. That's where we aim to be. I mean, we're not playing the top, of course. The top we're playing the tournament to win. That's the yeah. that you go to every tournament. So I think it also lowers its power the better the player base is. Mm-hmm. Then I'm starting to notice this is a, starting to be a trend now in a lot of Zoo Elish decks is that Golden Lord is getting hit from three to two, and then you, you guys opted to play uh, two in, in your decks. Uh, can you tell me why that is? Yeah, I think, honestly, I think it was a mistake to play two. Um, I, I had a list with one before the tournament, mm-hmm. and I, I, I actually registered with that, but then at 7 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> I changed the list again to two lot because I got scared. Um, I mean, there's a few upsides and a few downsides, so it's it's kind of hard, to be honest. Like, the second lot is really, really important against uh, the Eldritch Mirror. Mm-hmm. I think if you're playing the Eldritch Mirror with one lot, pretty much can't win game one at all because if they bench it with Rua Kero <laughs> or I don't know maybe they're playing Ice Dragon's Prison if they bench it with anything basically you just lost because mm-hmm. your Eldritch Engine is dead yeah. the other thing is um, Virtual World plays Called by the Grave and they have Shen Shen so that's two other cards that can bench a lot as well <laughs> against Virtual World it's not that huge though because um, for them to reach Shen Shen means that they are already playing yeah. which isn't that common like if they're already playing it's weird. Like usually, you just prevent them from playing, or they can just play, but then you also just lose because um, they can combo. So versus virtual world, I felt like the one was still fine, um, but in the end, I decided to play for two mainly because of the eldritch mirrors. But in this tournament, I drew the second lot a lot, and it's like, well, I mean, not the second lot. I drew lot in general a lot, and it's <laughs> a really, really bad draw. Yeah, I think it's to be honest. I think it's the yeah, I think it's the only brick in the stack unless you consider hand traps a brick, but. I think you shouldn't because those, those are just defensive cards. Yeah. So Lord really is the only brick. And yeah, I, I wish I would have played one. And I had the same list with one Imperial Order um, instead of Lord in the main. Mm-hmm. And that I think would have been better because I can definitely recall at least two games that I just lost because of, of drawing the second Lord. Obviously, I, I would still cite it because, like I said, you just need it for the Eldritch Mirrors. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think maining one is better, to be honest. But just just maining one Golden Lord, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just maining one because wow. because of the bricks. Yeah, yeah, because it, it's because it's, like against the combo deck, if, against combo decks, if you think about it, you're not really grinding a lot with them. So it's it is kind of unlikely that a lot gets banished. Like especially against Strytron, I don't even think they have any way of removing yeah. uh, the one lot unless they're playing called by in the main. I think yeah, it's just called. So yeah, it's just called by right. So I think in in those matchups, you just rather draw another card because it is just a brick. 
and Jesus, like I, I've gone like against like many of the the Eldritch decks before, and like Golden Lord is, is is such a pain for me to get around, especially when it's like boosted with a thirty five hundred attack, because there's not a lot of ways for Drytron to get around that. They have to go, they have to commit to like Boral Sword or Zeus is really like the only way to get get rid of that. So like I, I think a Golden Lord has just kind of got a lot of utility against Drytron itself. I mean, like. I think yeah, it's not that easy to out them. Uh, mm-hmm. I mean, they also have Natasha, mm-hmm. but I guess you can say that if there's some Natasha, you probably already lost the game because that means that Natasha's resolving like two or three times. Yeah, your deck, your yeah. deck is so bad, like ceiling wise, that you lose if they do anything. Uh, even if they can't out a card, you're probably still losing if their engine ke- gets going. Since your engine is yeah. so inferior to theirs, you have to stop them doing them. Stop them from doing anything, and the best way to have that is just opening more hand traps and hoping they can't play, which is the idea of Elf mm-hmm. right yeah. now. It's it, it's a grind deck, but it, it kind of isn't. You're try, it's kind of just trying to make Zeus as quickly as possible. <laughs> so who said that they didn't go against a lot of Drytron that day? Was that, was that Gabe or is that Christian who said that? Yeah. I only played against one Drytron. Oh, you played one? Yeah. Oh, I, so I Gabe, did you four. go against a lot of Drytron? Yeah, I played four. Four. Which is kind of unfortunate because it's actually like it's yeah. one of the, the things of trivia trees. You can end up with like mismatched matchups. Like I would love to have played a bunch of Eldritch that they played because Dragon League is pretty decent against control. Uh or virtual road, but I play like one virtual road, a bunch of Drytron compared to their matchups. So yeah, it's it's a bit a part of it. <laughs> how, how many rounds was this event? Uh eight. Oh, eight rounds. So you, so you guys were in for like a really long day. Like, was it was it a one day event or two day event? Sorry. Yeah, two days. We did have two rounds. Two we did have two round buys because Paulo is a UDS champion. Oh yeah, right. Okay, he's <laughs> good. To, good to know for uh, good to know for next week. I'm really going to bug him about that. Uh, it's lovely. I don't have to wake up. Early. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then like again, you like when when I saw that Paulo won and I saw you guys won, I'm like, man, I'm like that. It made me really happy because, again, like Paul, Paul's a good friend of mine, and like I was happy to see him win because like, I was wanted him to come on my podcast. I just want to know when was the time was right, and after you guys won, I'm like, okay, it's definitely the time is right. I'm like, but I thought I want to get you guys on here as well because you know I, I want to know your perspective and I want to know how like how it came up that you you and guys and Paulo got together and you know maybe happy that you guys won too. So uh, you know, looking at your deck list now, um, are there any other changes that you would make to it? Uh, I want to change some stuff. I probably want want to play uh, Red Eyes Darkness Metal Dragon. It came up a couple times. Oh really? How come that didn't make the the deck build originally? Uh, it's because I didn't think about what what one of the guys that top two Dragon Link did. He played one Black Metal, one Red MD. So playing that makes the Apollosa play slightly easier. It's not why he played it. It's just like a coincidence. But mm-hmm. it does make the one play that I was trying to do a lot easier, and it's pretty good to draw. It would. I don't think it would have changed that much result-wise, but like, I wanted it like two times, so I want at least to test it. But it's a mm-hmm. different form. Uh, like Yu-Gi-Oh is too volatile to say like this, because now we have new cards, we have new decks, we have people adapting. We build decks tournament to tournament. We will see how things go from here. Uh, well, for the Elvish deck, I mean, obviously you can't play the Anaconda anymore. Oh yeah. <laughs> If you summon it now, yeah, <laughs> they just won't use Zeus, so I, I, it doesn't work anymore. The next step is just playing Dragoon cards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was also joking joking uh, about that. If you just play Dragoon now, because they won't use the Zeus, so you can use the Anaconda, but it's just not worth it, because like you just add three bricks to your deck. But Fine. yeah, I mean, in the extra deck, I would have changed some things. Um, I We definitely should have played the second Bobo. I think uh, Gabe also mentioned that after the tournament. Please put a second Bobo in. There were like, (laughs) yeah, so (sighs) there are three games that you needed a second Bobo, and I was looking at that on the corner like, (laughs) imagine this was a Bobo. Our life would be way easier right now. (laughs) Yeah, it's kind of weird because in testing, the second Bobo just never came up. But I think that was because I was only testing against Virtual and Drytron, and like. Like I said, I only played against one Drytron this entire tournament. I think I played against two or three Virtual Worlds. So I was mostly playing Rogue decks, to be honest. And <laughs> obviously against Rogue decks like Shadol or the El Ishimura, you're grinding a lot more. <laughs> and when you're grinding, the second Bobo can definitely make a difference because it means that after your first Zeus gets outed, you're going to have a four material Zeus again. Whereas if you're only playing one Bobo, then you can only do a three material Zeus, <laughs> which yeah, isn't really amazing. 
So that was something I should have definitely played at two. Also, I think the author should have been cutted because that cut also never came up. And in case of Anaconda, I mean, I know it didn't, I said it didn't come up, but there was really good reasoning to play the cut and it came up a lot in testing. In case of Orsa, it was just there for like, if you randomly play Mirror Match or if you play against Virtual World, there's some, there's some OTKs with it because you can take the Lili or the GG, but I feel like that's just way too situational. So that cut also should have been cutted. Mm-hmm. And then in hindsight, yeah, I mean, I would definitely play the second Warble and I think... Maybe I will play Cerberus or Unicorn and just hope people are doing the Zeus in the main monster zone. I mean, even if not, it's still okay spot removal, so I feel like those are links you could play. Also, um, in the main deck, like I said, I think I wouldn't main Crow or Droll anymore because I think most popular deck for sure now. I mean, it was already, but I feel like now even more people are going to play it. And the kind of, the issue is kind of that... Now, I think we probably should play Nibiru in the main, but like I said, it has a lot of issues, especially in this deck. But I would look out for more cards that you can main that are good against Virtual World. Um, so that's something I would change in the main deck. And the other thing is that mm-hmm. you can also play the new pot in this deck, the pot of mm-hmm. Prosperity, no, or pot of Disparity, I think. Uh, pros- uh, prosperity. Yeah. Prosperity. Name. Yeah, you can play that pot, yeah. which, I mean, it's a pretty solid boost honestly because obviously it gives the deck more consistently and more consistency especially post side it can access power cards like cycle meter or mistaking arrest or even draw in lockbird that i played um those cards are pretty good and in this deck i mm-hmm. think you can even do pr- prosperity for six because um i mean it makes the grind game worse but especially against combo decks there's not really much grinding there you just pretty much need a good turn one setup and then you set up a turn three, which they they can't break your board, and then usually you just win from there. So that's definitely a card I want. I want to try out. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, the card is kind of weird in this deck. Uh, I, I I thought that's what someone else said about it. But I think it was Paulo. Uh, it, it seems kind of awkward, doesn't it? Like you, because what are you drawing into? Like I guess you can fetch going second the missing zoo or eldritch piss, but then you're playing it over a hand trap, right? It's basically the only spot you can cut for it. Yeah, and I know it is awkward. I mean, game one, I don't think it's it's that huge because, yeah, like you said, there's not really much you can get. Probably the best thing is if you have, like, one Eldritch card and you get the missing piece. Like, if you have Konk or Huracaru, you, you get a Sangreen with it. But other than that, you're probably just adding, like, I don't know, either a Zoo play, then it's also, I think, good. But if you already have, like, a Zoo play and a, um, and an Eldritch play alive, you're just probably getting a Hand Trap, which is not like that huge but i think post side it gets a lot better because yeah you can access the power cards no yeah that's fair and how do the bunny blast work for you bunny blast was pretty good um the main reason you played is because against uh virtual World, it prevents the dryden from getting negated from kingdom because bunny blast says that when mm-hmm. a spell targets X, xyz you can detach one and you negate the spell so it's mainly for that, but there's also a red peer play, which you can do with Bunny Blast, and that is if you have uh, one red peer, or one tanky that searches the red peer, you can send the Bunny Blast off the red peer, and then you would go into Charcanine, reborn the Bunny Blast, then you put another zoo on top of the Charcanine, then you make Dryden, and then the Dryden can pop the Bunny Blast, which can add the red peer from Grave again. And ah. yeah, that's cool, because that means that even if your Dryden gets outed, you're going to have a follow-up play with a zoo in hand for next turn, which I think is kind of important because um, the zoos are pretty much your ring condition because, um, yeah, the six material zoos is really, really huge. So the goal is, like, if they kill your Dryden, you're still going to have another zoo for next turn in your hand. And that was the that was the other reason to play the Bunny Blast for that play. Did that play come up very often for you when you when you were playing? It did, yeah. Pretty much every time I had Tanky or Red, I would usually go for that play. Um, unless I already had another zoo, then you're obviously going to get a uh, blade from Tanky just to get another draw. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Cause this is the first time I've, uh, I've seen bunny blast in a, in a zoo Eldritch deck list before. And, and Christian looking at your deck list, it's, it's pretty much the exact same as, as Paulo's deck list. Uh, was there any, did you guys have any arguments at all or any debates on like maybe some card differences when you were getting your deck list um, together? 
and try to real crawl. I think I think the only two things where we disagreed were mistaken arrest. Um Paolo was really convinced about the card. I was between mistaken arrest or anti spell fragrance because I think um while right mistaken arrest is obviously really good against Drytron, it's not really good against Virtual World. I think it's pretty underwhelming yeah. to be honest. Like I didn't even cite it in because you're just blocking one search and that's not really enough to prevent uh, to stop them from playing. But <laughs> the other card we would have played instead of mistaken rest was anti spell fragrance, which I think is better against virtual world because it stops um, King Long, it stops Kaloon, stops the Zayas, which are pretty important to stop, especially the six spells because they're usually preventing your Dryden from, or they usually negate your Dryden. So that means if you have anti spell and the Dryden, they won't have any way to negate the Dryden. So that means they are only plays to normal summon a name and then reveal another name in hand. And if you draw in the normal summon name, they're usually just passing. So against Virtual World, it's a lot more impactful. But against Drytron, the issue with Anti-Spell is that if you can't access a zoo play alongside Anti-Spell, like if you don't open a zoo, which I know is not that likely, but if you don't open it, you pretty much just lose because they're just going to set all their spells. And then with only Eldritch cards, you have no ways to, to kill them. And the next turn, they can just play again. Um, so the main reasoning to not play anti-spell was Drytron, which I agreed in the end. And then the other, um, I guess, opinion difference we had was the one lord. Like, I wanted to play one lord, one order in the main. Paolo was convinced about two lords. And, mm -hmm. yeah, again, I, I feel like my deck list with one lord, one order was better. I don't know, he probably would still disagree. But that was the other um, difference we had in opinions about the deck. But otherwise... Uh, yeah, we just fully agreed on the other 68 cards in the deck. Was the theory behind the anti-spell fragrance against Drytron was to at least, like, kind of hopefully, like, try to set up Zeus in some way against them eventually and then have, like, anti-spell to make them, like, set all the spells? Because we know that Drytron is a very, like, heavy spell deck because there's, there's next to no traps Yeah, in the I deck. mean, they're definitely playing a lot of spells, like it stops the Emergency, Preparation, Fafnir, Nova... So Anti-Spell has a lot of good targets that it stops. Um, obviously, they can still play with their Drytrons, but Anti-Spell is never going to be your only interruption in a stack. Like, it's always going to be Anti-Spell with at least two other interactions, which was usually usually enough to stop them. And yeah, the goal was if you had an Anti-Spell and a Zoo, they pretty much are forced to set all their spells because if they don't, I mean, they're not going to be able to use them in the next turn anyways, which is fine for you. So they're forced to set them and then you can just make the six material zoo, zoos and you would use one zoo sent on your turn. So you send all the spells, spells to the graveyard and then in the next turn you would still have two other zoos sends with like one or two more hand traps, which was usually enough. But the uh, mistaken mm -hmm. rest was just better to be honest because yeah, it's just another Jordan lock, but like it's even better than Joel because it also prevents the first search from going through. So that's pretty huge. And also it doesn't lose to any split rep removal. Like Lightning Storm, Harpy's Feather Duster, they don't work against it. They also don't work against Anti Spell, but they are also, or some lists also play Reboot, which doesn't work against them as taking a rest. And then there also rest some top four lists, I think, play Trintrist and Drytron, which, I mean, that wasn't really the reasoning we decided to play Anti where we decided to play Arrest in the end, but Trintrist is another card that would work against Anti Spell, but wouldn't work against mistaken arrest. Mm hmm. And then Gabriel, coming to you now with you, with your deck list, there you 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 also have like a number of hand traps in the side deck as well. Like you have your third Meister, for example. You're running Lancias and and, and Psycho Readers as well. Though like, it's just a bunch of like hand traps and like and and board wipes for the spell and trap cards. Uh, uh, so what was your reasoning behind uh, the philosophy of your side deck? I mean, you can't let the virtual order drive to play, unfortunately, because both of them have yeah. to kill you. I mean, Virtual World makes VFT, that's an FTK. Tritron makes 28 negates, that's also an FTK. So yeah. the only way to currently play Yu-Gi-Oh! is stopping them to play turn one. The best way to do it is just playing the best hand traps against both decks. So that's the idea. Mm -hmm. You're trying to open two or three hand traps and then like a one card starter, like Quick Launch, Seifert, uh, way to two dragons this game in this deck. So that's kind of what you're trying to do. You're trying to open enough mm -hmm. hand traps to not die and then kill them. Mm -hmm. And then a, a particular omission that I also noticed in all your decklists that neither of you were playing a Forbidden Droplet is all as as 
any any of your side or main deck. Uh, why is that? Uh, Droplets is a weird card. I mean, it's it's good against Drivetron. Uh, it's not bad in that matchup. The issue with Droplets is that it has zero overlap with Virtual Road. You can Droplets Virtual Road. It's impossible because there, there's no... The only way you can Droplets VFD is if you have a trap. Uh, but then you have to have a trap and they still have a Chuche live. Or if they make two VFDs, you need to discard like two mm-hmm. cards. Droplets are like off with that matchup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, the yeah. issue is also that I know some Eldritch Zodiac lists were playing Droplets, but I really don't think it's a good card, honestly. Because in this deck, I mean, usually... Well, I mean, you would think that it's good against Virtual World because obviously you have the LT traps, so you can go Droplets, discard a trap, mm-hmm. and then the VFD is that. But the issue is still that the Chucha is going to be live, so your Zoo player just won't go through. And then also, even if they don't have Chucha for some reason and you negate the VFD, they still have all their follow-up plays. So that's why I think against Virtual World, for sure, I prefer the hand traps more. I think against Drytron, mm-hmm. Droplets is better, but there's also a few issues with that. First thing is that um, when they end on the negations, the negations are usually fairies in hand, so Orange, Light, and Eva. And even if you negate the Herald there, they're still going to have Eva and Orange, Light, which also isn't that amazing. Um, mm-hmm. The last thing is that we are siding into 18 hand traps, so if we would have played Droplets, it would have been 15 hand traps and 3 Droplets. And the thing is, Droplets doesn't really mm-hmm. synergize well with your hand traps together. Because usually, when you use one hand trap, it won't really stop Drytron unless it's um, a well timed cycle reader or a draw and lock bird. But if you just use mm-hmm. Ash or Skullmeister, they are just going to continue playing. So, in that scenario, really, you really need a second hand trap because that's usually the card that's, that stops them from playing. Whereas, if you would have like one hand trap and then a Droplets instead of the second hand trap, then you one hand jumps is just a wasted card because they're just going to continue combring and then you have a droplets for next turn, which yeah negates the herald, but they're going to have uh, a lot of follow up and um, still an in negation in hand with Eva and Herald. So that, that was the reason I didn't play it. Yeah. Is it also is it also fair to say that because the uh, you know Eldritch uh, Eldr- Zoo Eldritch is that like every single card is is so uh, vital to like disrupting your opponent is that like, you can't really afford to to lose any of those cards with forbidden drop to stop something when rather you'd play like one card itself to kind of do like a very like, a similar job or even a better job than what drop is supposed I to think, do um it depends because like with an eldish card it's kind of fine that you you can because you can discard the eldish card for free pretty much because mm-hmm. you are going to get the graveyard effect anyway um, but there's also mm-hmm. some hands where you just don't open Eldritch card because we are siding out three against the combo decks post side. So in hands with like <laughs> only hand traps and zoo monsters, yeah, yeah, you can't really afford to discard anything with droplets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when you were, were there any like fun highlights that happened for the both of you when you were playing the the LCS over the weekend? The German TV. Uh... Oh yeah, that was a funny one. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was kind of uh, funny because so, I think it was in uh, top eight or something. Like my match concluded first, and then I think we wanted to coach Paulo or Gabe, but I had like really loud background noises, so I I I couldn't coach him, and then Gabe had to do it alone <laughs> because my TV was just so loud. <laughs> yeah, I uh, I randomly changed between Portuguese and English. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. When I get nervous, I start speaking Portuguese, but then I don't know if Christian is listening. I mean, Paulo can speak in Portuguese. And then Christians here are like, oh, fuck. Oh, I gotta go back to English. Oh, okay. <laughs> we we had a very fun top four game, right? The, yes. The, I was the, going to mention the, that, yeah. The... So <laughs> I won my game like super fast, like five minutes. Uh, Christian lost his. And then we were coaching Paulo. And then Paulo was playing game three against Drytron. His hand was Driver. So it's driver DD Crow Outland Outlitch card, Outlitch card, something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. And they're like, yep, we lost this. And then the first thing he does is go instant fusion for millennium wise. So we're like, okay, this is absolutely lost. There's no way we're winning <laughs> this game. We have one hand trap, he has millennium wise. This is not working. But then he drew like every single brick. He drew Mitionis and Down Knight. So he actually made Harold, but that Harold was only with three negates, and one of the negates was an Eva. The negate was Eva that would discard and fetch two more negates. Mm-hmm. And then Paul drew Barrage for a turn. 
So we were oh. we were able to DD Crow the Eva after he tried to negate the Lord. And then barrage into Zeus, into a six material Zeus, and somehow win that game. We had no business winning. <laughs> uh, and, and, then, and then if he had lost that, then that, that, that would have been it, right? Yeah, like, yeah. He would have been knocked out? Yeah, it was like the last game of top four. Yeah. Oh, we, were, we, I mean, oh, we accepted we yeah. lost already when we saw that. And we're like, yeah, <laughs> this is it, guys. It was a good run. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was madness. And to be honest, if, if that would be I, a game one of. Another match I would have played, I wouldn't have won that because I will I would have scooped like after seeing that yeah, he had yeah. institution and he could combo. I I would have scooped that game. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh really? Oh. I mean, it's, like, it's usually not even that bad to, to scoop early because you get time to coach other people, but I mean not when you're the last player. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty uncommon that you still win those games, so we were kinda yeah. lucky that it wasn't top four and he also yeah. He also didn't play that optimally. We should have we should have won that game, but it's part of your game. Yeah, he, he uh, did a they few never missteps, yeah. Yeah. But to be fair, I think it's understandable like, because it's in top four. Like everyone is really nervous, yeah. so can't really blame him for not playing optimally. Yeah. There. And if everyone mm -hmm. played optimally all the time, this game would be a 50-50, right? Because there there would be no point. The the idea is that you're winning games because people are making mistakes and you aren't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's part of your game. Yeah, that, that's what it is. Because, again, there's been, like, I'm sure we've all had, like, a lot of matches where, like, there's nothing we could have done to, like, to win any game. Because that's, that's just how the game is designed. Because that's, that's what happens. Yeah. Like, we, we've, we've all had it. So, it, it really does come to, and I, I seem to, like, at least when I play my local friends, like, I, I, when I, majority of the time I win, it's because I notice a lot of mistakes that they make. It's like, okay, I play, like, really well. Maybe I made a mistake here and there, but they made a ton more mistakes than I did. It's, and I think right now it's pretty much who makes the least amount of mistakes in this case that can, that wins the most, even though you can, like, still lose some games or that you could have had no business, like, winning whatsoever. Yeah. You you give us about making the least amount of mistakes and getting the most of the the, the, the hand you're dealt. Like you can't win every game. There are games you're going to lose regardless. You have no win condition. Nothing that you do in that yeah. game affects the result. But the difference between a good player and an average player is winning more games you shouldn't than just winning the games you're meant to win by like divine hand giving that gave the correct hand to you. You gotta steal games, mm -hmm. you gotta win games that you're not deserve to you gotta go for like the the 10 percent the five percent find your win con in games that it's not an obvious win con I think. yeah that's especially when like you you're trying to win it you can't lose more than like two matches in a tournament world so you get knocked yeah. out so you really have to find that like really level of consistency to be able to like top these events and like and uh, another question I have for you, Gabe, is that uh, the last one you won, you actually won an LCS before this, you won it with Virtual Worlds. Yeah. Uh, how come you opted not to play that deck this time around? Because Virtual Worlds has massive consistency issues. Uh, mm -hmm. I also didn't think, looking back, it was that good of a choice for the one I won, which is curious, right? I went like 12 0 that tournament. But yeah. th the other day, I didn't feel it was a good choice. It's bizarre. But I don't think results are a good metric. Uh, sometimes they can be deceiving. Like, I, I won a lot of die rolls, I got fortunate to not brick. That doesn't mean the deck is necessarily the best deck. Uh, mm -hmm. So after developing Virtual Road, it does brick more than I would like it to do. And I also mm -hmm. think that you're just coin flipping the Mirror matches and against Drytron. I felt that by playing something else, I had an edge. Even if I, I had room to have an edge, because my, my gameplay mattered. I, I, li I like to play games where I would win that another person wouldn't. Because that means that I'm doing yep. something. It's not just me drawing hands, opening the spreadsheet, and doing the things. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you, what would be like be a typical board that you would like to end on with with Dragon Links if you went first? Uh, so it's kind of like Seal Tiding Savage Hand Trap. That's what you're trying to do most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, depends how well you open. This deck has no linear combos. All the combos are depending all on circumstance. There's Chaos Ruler, which is like a massive variance card. Because that card excavates, so it depends what you hit and etc. Uh, but you're kind of trying to end on Seal Tidy and like then Savage, 11 year hand loop from Bro Tower. You can do Sanaphone against Tritron. You can do Hot Head Arch in the Beast. That's kind of the goal. The idea is not like an unbreakable end board. It's an end board that's good enough to get you to turn three. That when we, you get to turn three, you get to live near them from your follow up seal and then kill them. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, because because looking at the way like dragon links are like they're they're built for like longevity. They're built to like be able to grind, so like they can last like several turns. And I, I can understand that you know you know you just want to be able to survive a turn or two, or at least control the game, so that way you can like beat them like the next turn or the the turn after. I mean that that's what dragon links are supposed to do. They're, they're fast, but they can also set up and play for the long haul as well. Yeah. Uh, this deck is, I said that in my profile, it's kind of like Salomon Great when you think about it, which is bizarre. <laughs> but it's kind yeah. of the same idea. You're trying to do like enough not to die, and then you have like all the those, all your engine generates follow up. Heretic Seal is a follow up mm -hmm. card, Tiny is a follow up card, Boot Sector is a follow up card, Bro Tower. So that's what you're kind of trying to do. And since you're playing that deck, it also accommodates a lot of hand traps, which is important to not get VFD'd. <laughs> It's like no, nobody wants to get VFD. It's 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 such a painful card to go against. And, it, uh, it's an FTK. It's it's a modern day FTK. Yeah, it is. And the, would you would you guys like to see it like go if uh, if the next list came? Please, out? please. <laughs> like, oh, who designed the card? How, who who do, how do you look at a card like your opponent can't do things? <laughs> they have to pass. Yeah. How, how's yeah. that good card design? When when people were making like five six negate boards, it's less oppressive than a card that just says no. Like even against Drytron, right. like they have five negates. You you have like going second cards. You have options against VFD. There's mm -hmm. just like nothing. There's only like super yeah. niche cards that deal with VFD that don't deal well with VFD and don't deal with anything else but VFD, like XYZ and Kors or some stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, this format would be so bad, so much better than VFD. <laughs> I think so too, but I also think. Oh, what about um, you, Christian? Yeah. That it's not the only card that has to go. Like, Triton definitely also needs a hit. I think they should probably ban oh, yeah. Benton. I think that would be good. But yeah, I yeah. mean, definitely VFD is one of the main issues this format. So I would also like to see. I it mean, go. The, mm -hmm. this format has a lot of issues. Let's not get this wrong. But I mean, in the scale of issues, I think VFD is like public enemy number one. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, yeah, I, I, the I issue is that, that I think generally over 2020, there's been kind of a trend in new sets, which is that the only decks that really get a huge push are combo decks. Like it started in the beginning with the set where Fiber and uh, I think it was the Mecha Phantom these link, they, those were released, Union Carrier was yeah. released. Then in summer, we got the Adam Emancipator card, which was another like really, really broken combo deck. And then now we got Virtual World, we got Drytron. The new nobleman of crossouts, well, crossout designate, I think is the name, is coming yeah. out. So I would really like to see some, like, some combo hits and more releases that favor the control decks more. To be fair, mm -hmm. I think combo has been getting slightly nerfed. Like combo today is less oppressive than the block the emancipator was. Well, yeah, but uh, to be fair, it was also like probably the worst deck ever. One of the best decks ever. Yeah, yeah that, that's also true. That's probably the best deck in the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. So I don't. But at least the decks are doing. They're doing things in engine, which is easier to hit, like, like in a bandless sense. The issue with Block at Emancipator and Inferno, but they all are doing the same thing, basically masked in different skins. They're all doing Link Cross, Needle Fiber, yeah. Dragon Link or similar. Like they're all kind of the same deck. Now they're different decks, which is good in a way. Because, for example, you can hit their engine with cards like draw Lockbird against against Triton and Lancey against Virtual World. The bad thing is those decks are super oppressive against Control because they have so much recursion. Like they're not like they're not a glass cannon combo deck. I would say Triton has like a better grind game than Eldritch Zoo, for example, yes. which is bizarre, yes, right? Yeah. It, it is true. really yeah, yeah. Like it just does. Like all all, the, all their cards keep like keep getting value. Virtual World, you can't hand trap the deck because all their cards keep in hand. So I think you had like a change of the style of combo that is happening right now, but we can hopefully solve it with a list. Hopefully, I'm not optimistic. I'm never am. <laughs> I mean, we, we've seen it like Burning Abyss, for example. We've seen that deck take like a million different transformations throughout the years, and it's the, one of those decks that doesn't seem to die. It's, it's kind of like that, for example. We've seen it have different play styles. Like we've had like a, like a monster mash, and then we've seen like a huge trap wave. Like we've seen it going through different things. So uh, let, let's use Dry Trons, for example. If we were to take away Benton from the deck, uh, do you think there'd be another way that you could play with Dry Trons? Yeah, I think so. I think Dry Trons like a fine engine, even without Benton, especially with the new card coming out at some point. Uh, they have an XCs coming out in Lightning Overdrive. Mm -hmm. Which mm -hmm. is a crazy card. 
the the issue is just the, I don't think it's the engine. It's just that it has so many broken things it can enable. Like no one's even mm-hmm. playing Vanity's Ruler anymore. But that, that's yeah, that's an issue being by itself. Like they can search a floodgate. They just say it's no as well. It's not as aggressive mm-hmm. as VFD, but it's kind of close. I think hitting Benton is a yeah. is this, oh sorry, you can go ahead. No, 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 no. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, oh, oh, sorry. Sorry. Yes, I was gonna say I, th- I think hitting Benton is still a pretty good s- step to be honest to weak to weak the deck because then you pretty much make it like super fair because they have to like tribute a drytron after drytron so they're not going to get two pluses now they're only getting the one drytron <laughs> search and that i feel like is a lot fairer also because benton can search like cuts mm-hmm. like yeah, gabe mentioned uh, the vanity ruler it can also search lance here such as the herald natasha so yeah yeah I don't, you, you don't need to kill combo. Like combo is a part of Yu-Gi-Oh. It always has been in different iterations. You just, I just don't want combo to like win instantly when it goes first, and that it forces a point that like everyone has to be playing seventeen hand traps to have a chance to play Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> I mean, that's what you guys were doing. You were playing a whole ton of hand traps to 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 mean to beat Drytrons because they can just kind of go off in in an instant, especially with Benton, but. Uh, you know, a lot of people were running, at least in like the very early stages of it, a lot of people were thinking about like Megalith being used in Drytron. Do you think like if we were to take out Benton, then maybe like Megalith would start taking their place? The only reason you can play Megaliths in Drytron is because of Benton, though. Because Fu, okay. Fu enables the to get Benton from Grave and tribute Benton to summon a Megalith. So Benton <laughs> is actually the enabler. I think you can... Y- I don't know exactly what you should do without Benton because the deck is literally better. <laughs> so, but you can do something. Uh, the cards are mm-hmm. good enough to be played. You probably have to play like a more mid range deck. Maybe you gotta play like mm-hmm. the Dry to Rituals for once. Mm-hmm. And what if uh, Benton was at one? Then what do you think? What do you think the chase would be then? I think the deck then you can hand trap it. Like if you crow Benton, Benton's gun. It doesn't have Natasha's yeah. like an oppressive card against control as well. Uh, I think Benton 2 1 would be a fair hit. I don't think you need to ban it. I think 2 1 you already do enough. Deck's at least more hand trappable with Benton 2 1. Because if you crow Psycho Reader, it, it's just gun. You can't recur it. Mm-hmm. And then your cards cost something. The issue with Benton is that it makes all the dry trunks free. <laughs> they just special stuff. Yeah. get a free card. Benton gets another Benton. Just free other. Yeah, yeah it's, just, it's free recycling at this point in time. And like, and. I know, like me, most of my combos right now, like for Drytrons, don't just use two Benton because I'm always trying to put out like Herald of uh, Herald of Ultimateness out in the board as like as a final board rather than like Vanity's uh, Ruler anymore. I barely, I have Ruler in my deck, but I barely open it up first turn. It's usually for like a maybe like a second turn if I go against like Eldritch or something, so they can't like special summon any of their traps and like get the secondary effects with with Golden Lord nowadays. That's that's kind of how I always see it as right now. I'm still tinkering with. Vanity's really even being in my dry trown deck or not. It's it's a really weird thing right now for me to with, with that card. Like Andres Torres last week, like two weeks ago, told me he stopped playing it out, right? I don't know. Everyone's starting to uh, not play it anymore. So I mean, like what do you guys think of Vanity's rule right now being in dry trons? Uh, it's a weird card. Like it's a brick by itself, right? It's not a playable card, but it's a fairy. Yeah. I like ruler for siding patterns when I was playing dry tron because it allowed you to take ultimateness out. And you could take like more fairies mm-hmm. out and just keep Ruler as a win con. But the, the issue is that it's a weak win con against Virtual World because they have Kowloon and King Long. So those are like six mm-hmm. outs. Uh, so I, I think you probably just don't play Ruler. Most of the top list didn't. Mm-hmm. The only reason you would is if you're playing the Extravagance list with Dimension Shifter, that deck has to play Ruler. Mm-hmm. I, haven't, I haven't seen that list yet. Uh, what, t- can you tell me more about that kind of list? Because I haven't seen it. Uh, it's going around top. Top rated on DB. We tested it for a bit, like before people were doing it on DB. Actually, uh, you, you mm-hmm. kind of just play Drytrons with extra and like nine hand traps with one of them being Dimension Shifter because Benton can trigger from Banished. So yeah. you can still just Ruler under Shifter, and Shifter is the best hand trap against Virtual Road. Maybe that's the way to play mm-hmm. the deck going forward. Mm-hmm. And, and then Gabe, did you did you build your your deck yourself, or did you have a little help from uh, from from Christian or, or Paulo with your deck list? I mean, I had help uh, last week from Chris and Paulo because they are doing their thing. Uh, I had a yeah. lot of help from a friend named Josh Josh Kirby. He's one of the top rated players in DB. I had some questions about my deck, like close to that line, and he helped me a lot. We changed some stuff, and it worked pretty well. So shout out to him. 
Mm-hmm. And what did you guys end up winning at the at the end of the day with uh, with this LCS? Uh, money, seven hundred dollars. Uh, yeah, I think it was seven hundred <laughs> yeah. each. And then we got the trophy, I think, and some boxes. But I think we still have to yeah, just, just discuss how to split them. <laughs> So, so no, it's yeah. six oh, boxes. Okay. It's six. Two each. Okay. It's like I thought, I, I thought it was five. Yeah, six boxes. I mean, it oh, would be so very dumb to do five yeah, for well, the team of three enough. people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I was gonna say that makes no sense. <laughs> but yeah, uh, so it's like eight hundred dollars of price support each. It's pretty good for a weekend. Mm-hmm. And uh, j- just out of curiosity, Gabe, like, where, where's do you have your trophy from your? Your last L- uh, LCS win. I'm waiting. I'm waiting on two trophies right now. I'm waiting on my trophy from LCS seven and eight. Uh, I'm waiting for Honey to ship them to me. I'm not. Cur- oh, so you haven't got them yet? Yeah, I haven't gotten them yet. Uh, I guess <laughs> he can just send them all together now. He can send you in the same package. <laughs> I mean, I hopefully hopefully that'll shape on shipping for him now. If he if he can send it all at once. Honey can say it don't help him. <laughs> I- I, either that, or you can tell him to wait and, until the next LCS. Hopefully, win that one, and then he can send out maybe three at once. Oh, he, jo- he, he joked <laughs> on when he was trying to pay me that next time he's just gonna ask people to transfer me directly the entry fee. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, hopefully they arrive. It's gonna be funny. We're gonna do a picture. Yeah. <laughs> did, did anything else uh, like kind of funny or really cool happen during uh, during the LCS? Like any like cool stories that that, uh, that happened? I don't remember anything else. I mean, pretty much, yeah, I mean, I don't know anything specifically, but I really enjoyed the overall experience. Like getting to play with your friends yeah. in the Discord call is like really cool. And then I, I think especially finals was cool because, like I said, we, we were all oh, sitting wow. there, we were discussing every play, and then in the end, we just won the whole event. So that was pretty nice. Oh, I have a funny story actually. It's not tech yeah, go ahead. related, but I woke up on Sunday with no internet at in my place. Oh, uh, it was like 8 a.m. in Brazil, so I, I, yeah. I woke, I, I woke up and saw my girlfriend was like, she's like, uh, internet isn't working. I'm like, oh shit, uh, and then I called like the the ISP and a tree fell over my internet box on Sunday. <laughs> so, oh, like, no way of coming back today, so I had to like call around my friends, see whoever had like a house available that I could go to. And then a friend like allowed me to go there to play, so I played all of day two from his couch. <laughs> oh, geez, wow! And like, what was your like reaction when you like actually found out that your internet was out? I mean, like when you woke I was up. a bit concerned. I mean, I knew that I would solve it. It's just annoying because I would rather be at home, right, and have to do all of this. But I guess I just yeah. entered on like problem solving mode, like solve this because I don't want to let the guys down, and. Yeah, of course. And yeah, so it sorted it out, but it was a bit of a stress. But then I was like, I'm not going all this way to just drop. I guess we got to win now. <laughs> and I mean, we did, so fair play to you guys. <laughs> did this event feel like doing it like a lot longer than like if we were playing like in a, in a real life event? Uh, that's similar. I mean, you're playing less games than in a real life event because it's... Actually, I don't think it's that longer. In real life events take forever. I think we're just not used to them anymore. Yeah, to be honest, I think it yeah. it was probably shorter than in real life events. Yeah. Because I mean, well, there's I... not really waiting time yeah. between rounds in luxury, because like when the rounds is finished, yeah. they're immediately doing the pairings. Um, also, I mean, it was. I don't why twelve yeah. is between rounds. I mean, here it it was eight rounds. I yeah. think in the last pre three rice as it was nine, so you have an additional round. And then, yeah, I think it's a bit shorter, but it's pretty similar overall, to be honest. Yeah, because, yeah, like, results would be a little bit easier to submit because you don't have to, like, stand in line or anything or, like, go through a crowd and you can just, like, instantly just yeah, I mean, that, that's you know, one of the, the cool result. things in general about online tournaments. I mean, I definitely enjoy YCS as mm-hmm. more, of course, but I think online tournaments also have some cool mm-hmm. things. Like, you, you don't have to look for a hotel. You don't have to pay for, obviously, the whole travel accommodation. You can just sleep in your own bed, rake them in, in the morning, and it's pretty easy because you just have to get to your computer and then you play some rounds and then you have the rest of, of the day free for yourself. It, it's a different yes, experience. Yeah. Like, I would never change no, me neither. Uh, in, in real life. Tournaments. But uh, Yu-Gi-Oh!-wise, it's way more practical to play at home. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm on air conditioner... <laughs> The, uh, the, I'm like at my place. I don't have like 30, 20 people around me in a hot venue in the middle of nowhere. 
It's also easier yeah. to focus, to uh, be honest, because if you, if you just sit by yourself before your PC, I mean, at, yeah. at least for me, it's like way easier to focus in a really loud hall when people are playing besides me, talking, etc. Yeah, I, I agree. But I mean, I still, I still will trade all of this to be back with my friends traveling. Me too, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then, like another, also like a a problem that like almost every Yu Gi Oh player has had when they've like gone on the road is that like is is food as well because like you know not everybody packs a snack when they're going to these events when like at least at home it's like okay I need to get I, I'm done my round I need to, like a quick snack I can just walk like five steps to my fridge and just get a quick snack before I go back and play my next. You match. say that, but I somehow always starve when playing these tournaments. I'm <laughs> so I just like play, and when I'm done with my games, I'm watching other games or I'm thinking about my next game so i just realized i haven't <laughs> ate the whole day i'm just oh, i'm just a little yeah, bit yeah, yeah. Uh, i think the <laughs> issue was also that i think especially on sunday during top guys i think really often we were the um last team to finish the match and yeah. since we obviously yeah won every top cut match then the, the rounds <laughs> also just uh, like the the next top cut match also just started immediately for us so i think i got to have dinner at yeah. like 1 a.m after the time it was over on on Monday morning. <laughs> yeah, I didn't eat the whole day, but I mean, it's way easier to get stuff. It's it's way like you spend way less money as well yeah. because you're not yeah you're not investing into cars, you're not investing into travel, into accommodation, into food in the venue because somehow food in YCS is so expensive. I swear they're more expensive than in concerts or something. It's it's mad. Yeah. But but I mean you'd still we would still travel to events and whatnot if we if we had yeah, in real life events. Yeah, right for sure. now. yeah, for sure. It, it's, it's yeah, of course. I mean I, I would take IL events uh any day over online events. But it, it's still pretty yeah. cool. Like what luxury is doing I think is really good for the community because there's not really yeah. much else competitive you 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 can play right now. And I mean the LCS is they're getting like really big attendance in numbers. This one had I think almost four hundred players. And there's like really, really good players in, in the LCSs mm -hmm. as well. Like yeah. people that have 10 plus top people like Jesse Cotton and Paolo who are playing in those events. So it's a really competitive atmosphere. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they have really, really good prizes and they have good judges. So I think like personally, I really enjoy playing them. I really, really enjoy playing the tournaments. I hope Honey keeps up with them even after we get more, more RIO tournaments because I think it gives a lot of people that didn't have the opportunity to play competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! to do because in reality, competitive, competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! happens in two continents at the biggest cities. People that live in like Eastern Europe, South America, Oceania wouldn't get a chance to play the best players all the time. But now, like Yu-Gi-Oh! in Brazil, for example, is flourishing a lot. A lot of good players are coming. Because they get a chance just like they don't have to invest to travel to America to play. They can just turn turn in, open their notebook and they're playing against Jesse Cotton, against Paolo in a weekly basis, which is like so mm -hmm. so nice for the development of the game. Honey literally does more than Konami ever did. It's insane. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it was a conversation I had with uh, Andreas Torres last two weeks ago. Is that like just uh, that's what remote duels does? It's, it's a lot more accessible for for everybody to play, especially with like South America too, because like there are a ton of fantastic players in South America, like, like Andreas and uh, like Paulo, for example. And so it's just that like you know some people may not have like the the ability to go out and test with other people and whatnot. And this doing these online like tournaments and whatnot is like a really great outlet for them to like you'll know, be able to play all these players that they couldn't do before because you know they're like like miles and miles away from from someone else. Yeah, South America is a big pool of talent. I think we're very we're very competitive as a region. Uh, it's just because we don't get you because the biggest tournaments aren't here. The highlights the they aren't here, so people don't don't notice. But with the last years, I think it's changing, and I think it's just gonna keep changing as as time goes. As more and more South American players go abroad, play, and with the online scene, South America has a lot of titles if you if you look at it and results better than NA at times, like a lot of the LCSs. Which when you compare the amount of the player pool, it's insane. <laughs> And then Christian, for you, like you're all the way out in Europe, so like you and you have like a like a lot of competition out there, like a plethora of players that are out there. So I don't think that that's been like a really big problem for you for getting like competitive. Yeah, no, I, I mean I was already pretty much attending every RCS days in Europe. Um, I was attending every European Championship, of course, and then, uh, like you said in the beginning, I was also doing the worst race, where you obviously also have a really big competition when you have to travel to most big regionals all over Europe and that, yeah, you have to compete with 
pretty much the best place in Europe to to get the points. Um, so yeah, for me it was yeah like I did it in the past as well. Mm-hmm. You know, like, I remember there was like a like a big complaint with like the remote dual invitations that Konami did. Is that like it took like so long for the days to get done? Like for example, like here where I am. Um, like we would have to start tournaments around like eight a.m. in the morning, roughly. That's where that's where we would start. So I'm like I'm like two like two hours behind you, Gabriel, just to yeah. give you a, a time frame. And I'm like I think I'm like six hours. I think yeah, behind I think you six. right now, Christian. Yeah. I think it, yeah, I think it's six hours. So like, we, but we wouldn't end the day until maybe like sixteen out, like twelve, sixteen hours later, something around that time frame. And that's that's like a lot of time for you, Gil, where like we would expect to go like maybe eight to 10 hours for these kinds of tournaments. Like, I, I don't know what your guys' experience would be, but I would just think, like, the remote dual invitation was really long compared to, like, doing, like, the LCSs, which was done in a, like, from what you guys are telling me, like, at a, at a much faster time. Is, is that, is that, no, do, yeah, do, no, do you I agree with me on that true one? Because I've also heard things um, that the remote dual, I think it was in December, where you had to wait, like, two hours every round. And I think it was also because they had a system where mm-hmm. the loser of every match had to report um, the match instead of the winner. Oh. Uh, I think I think that's what Hani told me. And in that case, I mean, obviously the loser, like if the loser runs or goes from X two to X three, I don't think he's really going to bother much much sometimes, and then he's just not going to report. So that, that yeah. caused a lot of issues in the LCS. Um, obviously, the winner reports, so you just have to report in like one Discord section, and then there's always one guy who always checks checks the results of each match. And immediately after you put the results, um, they get registered into their um, system. And then we pretty much when the round is finished, the next round is already like it's going to start after after a few minutes. So that was always nice in the LCSs. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So as as we move forward now, now that um, like this this tournament is all done, and now we've got like the new set of Blazing Vortex that just just came out. Um, are there any? We have already mentioned Pot of Prosperity for at least for the Eldritch. Uh, would there be any other cards from Blazing Vortex that you might like look at for to maybe like put in your decks now, or like that would you, that would you would use for like future tournaments at all? There is Tri Brigade Kit, the new one. Uh, mm-hmm. That card is very interesting. Very good for the deck. It allows a lot of new options like Rescue Cat, you can play Desires in the deck. It's a deck that's already decent. Tristan topped with it, made top eight with Tri Brigade Little Risk. So mm-hmm. I think that's one of the most interesting cards of the, the set, a bit of a sleeper one. Mm-hmm. And I guess the virtual world support, Blazing Vortex is kind of a sleeper a set that's like, eh, there's not much. It's a bit unfortunate. The decks are all kind of bad. Yeah, like, because like a lot of people were saying, like, this, the, the set wasn't like very good or anything like that. I still think that there's maybe like a couple of good cards that can come out of it, but uh, it's it's been widely regarded so far as like a really underwhelming set. Like Christian, do you think there's any cards in here that you would probably like kind of pick up that would kind of like help? I mean, pretty much as, as Gabe said, I think it's only the four big cards. Yeah, it's the one. It's the Tri Brigade Kids. I think that's going to give the deck a pretty huge boost. So we have to see if. Dry Brigade uh, becomes a even bigger contender now because, um, like Gabe said, Tristan topped with it. So the deck was like the deck is already not bad, and now it gets more support. But mm-hmm. it does have some issues, um, which I don't know if you can really solve them. Like I think Lancey is pretty big against the deck, so yeah, we kind of have to mm-hmm. wait and see how that turns out. And then obviously, the cards I'm looking forward the most to are the the new pot and the two virtual world cards, especially because the two virtual world cards. Mm-hmm. Um, are boosting the deck like a lot and i think the new pod is also pretty good because one of the biggest issues in virtual world i think is the consistency and obviously the new pod really helps on that because now you now you can run five or even six pods if you want to you can play desires and the new uh, pot of prosperity and the cool thing is also i know that now most virtual world lists uh, are playing goods to boost consistency but Gus has some other issues, like when you can already play, the Gus is pretty redundant because it doesn't add anything to your combo because the King Long is only once per turn card. So I think the new pot yep. instead of the Gus is pretty cool because that way, even in hands that can already combo, you will have a pot which can add like maybe another name to play around the hand trap, for example. Or if you already have three names, you can add like a hand trap um, to cover their turn. So I think that's going to give the deck a pretty huge boost, and then obviously the the trap. I think it's it's, it's really really huge in this deck. 
I, I really like what you said about the foolish burial of goods because that's exactly how I felt when I played virtual worlds. Like it was, it was good when I had it, but if I already had the combo, then it was it was pointless for me to have for like the for the rest of the match, and it would just be it was just uh, it was just dead at, to me at that point in time. So I I think that that card can definitely be replaced now with uh, with make prosperity or at least something else now that we have like more virtual worlds coming. Yeah, out. for sure. I mean, technically, you could also I guess play like three pots. Or like I don't know five pots in general, and then goods alongside that. But I don't think it's really good because that way you have a really consistent deck. But on the other hand, you're going to have to cut down on hand traps a lot, which um, isn't really good because you still have to win the combo mirrors going second, obviously. So probably what I would I would do with virtual right now is I would cut the goods and I would play the new pot instead. Probably I would only play five pots uh, because you don't really want to see two pots together. And I think five is mathematically the best number mm -hmm. to only open one one of a card. And then I would definitely play the new trap. Mm -hmm. Regarding two two, I'm not sure how good that card is yet because it doesn't really boost consistency. Um, and I think most lists in the OCG haven't been playing that. But I mean that could also be because of Maxi. So I'm not sure. There's some testing I have to do. And then yeah, we pretty much have to see for the next LCS. I still think Alex Zuriak is a pretty good contender. But I think the virtual deck might now be too good uh, to combat if with a control deck. I'm not sure that's something I have to test. And then I think Dragon Link moving forward is also something uh, I, I want to test more. I mean, unfortunately, I don't think you can play any card from the new set in this deck, but I still think it's a really good option regardless. Yeah. Uh, before that, just real quick, uh, what would be the ratio of, of pots that you would play in the virtual world? Yeah, I'm in, actually not super sure. Uh, I'm tending to play three of the new pot right now, which um, I know isn't really a common opinion because obviously, like most people, would just value a draw two over a one out of six reveal. But I, I did some opening hands with it like a few weeks ago, I think, um, because I was, I was interested in which pot is better. And obviously, like, you can't really figure that out by the amount of opening hands I did. But I was noticing that there's kind of a trend, and it felt like the new pot was better, because the thing is with Desires, like, on average, you're going to draw one dead card and one good card. But there's also things, but there, there's also instances with Desires where you're just drawing two bad cards, so then obviously the card did nothing. There's really rare instances of you drawing um, two really good cards, then obviously it's better than prosperity but i think in the average scenario in the average scenario where you get one good card of desires and one bad card i feel like you would rather have the um the new pot because obviously you can choose the card you get also the thing is in virtual world if you think about it you don't actually have that many cards to get because pretty much the best cards in the stack are the 12 names like those are the cards you want to see those are your consistency cards and i think it's more likely to <laughs> get one of one out of the 12 cards with the new pot than with desires um i also think you can use yeah. the new pot for six in the stack especially in common worlds. i don't think you will really mind banishing six cards i think it's definitely fine because against combo yeah either you just combo off and you win the game or you don't combo and then you usually lose the game because they get the combo so i think it's fine to banish six and mm -hmm. if you just like if you reveal the top six of your deck and you get to choose the one name you add i think it's pretty huge I also think you definitely do six, yes. by the way. Like, people are playing extra in Virtual World. So it's basically the same thing, but you got to choose. Yeah, I, yeah. I think, I think it's 100% good. I'm, I'm also really sure. I think, people, I think people are freer than Dyer's. <laughs> I, I also think the new pot's better than than Desires. Your deck is probably the best deck in the format. The only thing that you're ho that's holding you back is, well, consistency. That card solves mm -hmm. a lot. So it's interesting mm -hmm. to see how Virtual World develops. Pretty excited about that. Do do you think that the, these new cards are going to help add to like the, the consistency issues that virtual world has been having? Yeah, basically the pot. I mean, uh, the trap doesn't change consistency wise. Like, it's more an extender when you're playing true stuff. It, it, it turns, I think, like one hand that wasn't VFT into VFT. Mm -hmm. But uh, the the new pots are good. The new pots definitely a, a playable card in virtual world. And yeah, I think that's going to make a big difference. Yeah, it's definitely one of the best cards that, to come out of this set for sure, and I'm pretty sure everyone is going to try to get their hands on it. I, I think that's e pretty easy to say. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, what was the, with the name of uh, Team uh, Fala Galera 4.0? What, what's what's the story behind that? I mean, it's Paulo's team name. It's always has been like that since the one he played and won, so I guess you're sticking with it. 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, you guys did. Did um, you guys care at all? No, nah, it's fine. It's a, it's funny. It, it became, it became yeah. kind of a Brazilian like slang phrase at this rate. Yeah, I, I oh, think okay. it's a Brazilian <laughs> thing to say hello or something, right, Gabe? Yeah, it, it's basically hello. Like it, it's what Paulo says at the openings of his video, so it kind of became like a trademark. Yeah, and that was the name he used for the first. Uh, oh. Team Rice, yes, IAL. Yeah. And then I think for the second one, he used Fala yeah. Galera 2.0. And then the luxury announced that the yeah, team, team, team LCS is. So we just went with the name. Yeah. I mean, how, how are we going to keep up with this? Like, where do we stop? Like, is 7.0 too much? Is 13.0 too much? You got to stop at some point, right? He can't just yeah. keep adding one at the end of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you, can so, you can ask him that next week. <laughs> yeah, I go well. So, so that just to be clear, that that's a that's like a Portuguese slang term for like for like a greeting. Yeah, like, you know, that's that's what fala galera means. Yeah, it's hey guys in English, like could be like that. Okay, so okay, so it's like if I were saying it's like what's up or like something like yeah, that. That's kind of what it would be. It's kind of what's up, I guess. It's like okay, uh, I'm, I'm less gotcha. formal. Hey guys. Yeah. <laughs> and and as you mentioned, like I've, I've got Paulo coming on for next episode. Uh, any. Any, any kind of messages or any, like, fun little jabs you want to take at him when he comes on for next week? Uh, I don't have anything bad to say about Paulo. It's, they can make fun of him for playing Eldritch cards, but I, there's crucial for him. There's a deal, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Christian, Gabriel, man, thank you both for, for coming on to the podcast. I really appreciate you guys uh, taking the time out to, you know, have a nice little fun conversation with me. And uh, congratulations, both you again, for winning the uh, LCS. Really happy for you guys to do it, especially with Paulo, who's also like a great person to be around and a great player as well. Uh, thank you guys so much. Thanks for a lot, on. man. Oh, thanks. Sure. Absolutely, man. Any uh, shout outs you guys want to give before we go? Uh, I wanted to shout out my team, the Disciples. We have a deck profile on our YouTube channel. And we post stuff on our Facebook page. Maybe you can get you can get that link on the description, the YouTube video. Yep. Uh, and shout out Swaf, the best testing circle in Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, six out of ten. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Shout out to both of my teammates again, <laughs> Gabe and Paulo, of course. And then yeah, shout, shout outs to my team, Eman Games, and also also shout outs to Raf because yeah, we're like always testing together in there, and that's really helpful as preparation for the LCSs. Yeah, and they're all uh, the great guys. Uh, it wouldn't be as fun without yeah. them. <laughs> and we'll put uh, all of the links down below in the description of the YouTube video. For it. so that is Gabriel Nets and Christian Thomas, two of the three winners of the LCS 3v3, joining me on for this episode's podcast. Gentlemen, thank you so much again for joining me on the podcast. You guys have yourselves a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. you.